Well, so it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to talk to you guys in, in, in what is a really you know, uh, uncertain but also exciting time in island daring. And, uh, and you know, you're probably not quite sure what's going to happen, but uh, you know, the world's your oyster with uh, the recent changes over the last few years and also uh, where we're going in the future. So what I wanted to do is just take you through a little bit of, of what we've done in, in New Zealand and, and the way I've made our, myself, my wife and I, how we've made our way in the industry. And just a little bit of a, um, we, we have a 50-50 share milking arrangement. It's just a little bit quirky, I guess. So just taking you through some of the things of how we set up that business and, and why we think it works not only for us, but also for our business partners. So our business partners, Jim Vanderpoel, who um, I think some of you will know as well. So, so I was born and raised in the North Island of New Zealand and then went down to college at Lincoln University in the South Island four-year degree there and, uh, and met my wife there too and, and she convinced me it would be a good idea to actually go be a farm consultant for a year. So I, I did that and, and don't regret doing that at all. I uh, went to the bottom of the South Island and, and started to be a farm consultant down there. It, it got to February and was snowing, uh, which is not unusual for you guys, but when it was snowing in, in New Zealand in February, I decided probably Southland wasn't the best place to live. So, so I actually uh, moved back and, and wanted to go back on farm. So we, we went and worked for uh, and managed the farm 750 cows for Spectrum Group, who Jim was part of at that time. So it was uh, the Van der Poles, Peter and Mark Wormsby, and uh, Mike, and, Mike and Andrea O'Connor. So they ran Spectrum Group, who had a dozen or 14 farms in Canterbury. And we went and ran one of their smaller ones, Chertsey Farm, which is this one here. So uh, 750 cows, I don't know how old I was there, but 23, I probably uh, still looked 15. So um, it was a big, a big challenge and, and one I didn't, really didn't want to stuff up. And uh, that probably echoes Matthew's point of, of making sure that uh, you know, the barrier is making sure you're leveraging off uh, ability because I didn't want to stuff it up on my first go. So uh, when we went there, uh, things crashed, so luckily I didn't own the business then, so, uh, but there was a huge drive to, to push um, cost of production down, which, which suited me fine, but there was also a big drop in stock value, so we'd come off a, a $7 payout, I think in 07, around that, those years, but, and we forecast for $4, but, so stock came down as well, so uh, me being not very patient after, after two months of working there, I suggested they should start trying to sell me some cows, and, uh, which they, in due course they did. And, and, and you know, we couldn't have done that without the help of the bank. So I, I guess this is the part Mike was alluding to earlier. So right when we started, we needed to be able to borrow money. Uh, we needed to get into this, this massive capital um, hungry business of, of farming. You know, um, you're talking 10, 12 million more or more to, to own a, a reasonable size farm. This 700 cow farm is you know, $12 million. How on earth am I going to get there from having nothing effectively to $12 million, and I've got to do it by the time, you know, realistically, by the time I'm 40. By the time I'm 40, I'm not much good after that, really. <laughs> and, uh, which might be a little bit rough on some of these out here, but, but my, my desire at 40 is, is a hell of a lot different to when I am at 20. So I haven't got a lot left in me, I don't think, um, by the time I'm 40. Hopefully that'll change. But uh, um, so, so we borrowed some money and we bought 60 cows and, and leased them back to the farm. And then the next year we had a little bit of leased land come in and uh, from the, the neighbouring farm that they owned as well did, weren't, didn't want to stock their farm up, they didn't want to milk any more cows. Uh, they had 1,600 cows through an 80 bale road tree and they thought that was, that was as much as that could, um, that could handle, so I'll go on to that bit later. But they didn't want to milk any more cows because they were at capacity. So as a, as a compromise, the, the owners of that business suggested we take some land away from you and we'll, we'll give it to that young, young fellow across the hedge and uh, see if he wants it. So they asked me if I, would, I, I couldn't get it as quick as I, you know, I wanted that as quick as I could get it because more cows. So, um, but I, I didn't want to just give them the hundred more cows to the business. I wanted, I wanted, I wanted a piece of that. I wanted to work hard and, and reward them, but I also wanted to reward myself. And I guess this comes to the next part. So I decided I'd, I'd buy half the cows and, and take that opportunity to up my, up my n numbers. So this is what we did. We bought some more cows and actually bought them from our farm in, in, the, in the North Island from, from mum and dad. So uh, probably the horrendous, they probably overpriced them, I'd say. But, uh, <laughs> but 
the key point, and, and, and Paddy wanted me to touch on that, this is you know, the initial step, and this is why we farm, right? So it's summed up in here. So, so cows, they have calves, that seems a pretty good investment to me. You go from one to two, so that's really good. And, and you could put a tag in, your ear, in its ear, There's some, some form of ownership. Now, what other business do you easily get that identifiable ownership? And, and that's, you know, that, that's about getting buy-in and what drives young people. If they can get, their, uh, get into it, get some buy-in, feel like they're sharing some of the rewards, then, then it's a win-win. I'm going to work harder, I'm more energised, want to do a better job and, and expand that business. So I guess that, that's a key. For me, putting a, a, a pink ear tag with, with grayling written on it, that was, that was a massive step for me and, and, and uh, really enjoyed doing that. So we, we did the two, uh, sorry, 800 cows next on the farm there for a, a couple of, two seasons as managing that farm. And then by that time, the guy on the 1600 cow farm was really get, must have been getting annoyed with me. So, was, uh, so he left and they, they pursued other opportunities. And th they asked if I would, wanted, was interested in, in running the 1600 cow farm, which of course we were. So cow prices by then had gone back up. So we just, we only could buy 10 more because I didn't think it was a very good idea to buy too many. So, uh, um, so, so we, we kept on buying, but, but not quite as many when, when the price went up a bit. But, uh, and this is, this is sort of where we are today. It's almost right. <laughs> Just when you think it's about to finish. <laughs> Surely, oh no, not this time. How many hours is that? It's a week, yeah. It's a, it's not a, not, no, it's not a week of uh, milking. It's, uh, so that's one afternoon. That was uh, a couple of years ago. So that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's Joanne. So she, uh, She's quite good. So that was, um, yeah, we were milking 2,300 cows then, and that's, that's from 1 o'clock to uh, oh, half past 5, 6 o'clock. So that's five hours worth of milking there, and that's, that's what we're doing at the moment. It's 2,300, 2,400 cows through that 80 bale cow shed that couldn't handle more than 1,600. So, um, at that stage, uh, uh, Spectrum broke up. Um, Jim Vanderpoel went his way, and, and he took that farm as his equity from the Spectrum group. So. Um, Jim took that farm and a couple of other farms in Canterbury and I guess it was at that stage that, that we, we got a, a bit of a lucky break and uh, had been um, pestering uh, Spectrum for a long time to, to get some more involvement in the business, not just a tag in the air but I wanted a stake in the ground as well. So uh, at that stage we uh, invested with Jim and, and we set up a, a share, milking, share milking arrangement that I'll, that I'll come to a bit, a bit sooner. So. But, but what does it take? You can't just, you know, Jim, Jim left this uh, left this partnership, and and we wanted to invest with him. But but you know what what were the principles that it was founded on, and so you can't just go out and, and set up a business with with anyone. You before that you've got to earn your stripes, and I guess that's what being part of the Spectrum Group was the corporate farming. Is, you know we had all the access to all the financial data, but better still we had the financial access to uh, everybody else's data in there as well. So we could uh, benchmark against everybody else and, and, and see, make sure we were doing a better job than them. And uh, I could quickly sit down and you know, say that we were doing $1,000 hectare better than that farm next door. So I was like, well, $1,000 a hectare times your 400 hectares, you'll be better off by 400,000 if I'm over there. A little bit known to me, it's actually a hell of a lot harder to run 1,600 cows than 700. So, uh, but, but being naive, I, I didn't need to know that until I got there. So, but the key things that drive profitability, and you, you've seen it already today, but uh, operating expenses. So the, the red line, the, sorry, the red dot up there is, is roughly where we operate. Um, but you know, you've got to have low farm working expenses. It doesn't matter how you get there, but, it's, but it tells you there's a direct relationship, 60% reliable, that if you've got low farm working expenses, you'll have higher profitability. The same pasture harvested, we've seen that slide already. This is just the dairy and Z data. Um, from New Zealand on, on that, and you know, we, we actually probably don't actually do as good a job as we should. Canterbury, which uh, I thought I was doing a reasonable job, and, and I was talking to somewhere one day, and they were wondering, you know, that, gee, that's a lot of cows. And, and Mike was kind enough to um, 
explain to them that Canterbury is the easiest place in the world to uh, farm cows, which seemed to belittle me a little bit. Uh, that, that I thought I was doing a pretty good job until Mike pointed out that any, any, uh, any fool could do it. So yeah. <laughs> So we've, we've actually got a bit of room for improvement there, but, but I guess that's what ke keeps, us, keeps us going. So, so we had to be profitable, and, uh, w which we had been for the, those four years of, of managing first the two next door and then, and then two on the bigger farm. And so we had to be profitable, and uh, th that gave us our leverage because we didn't really, well, we, we had 100 cows by this stage, which is not really a leverage in a, uh, in a $20 million venture. Um, 100 cows is probably not actually a lot of leverage, but. But what we did have was, was, was energy, and we had a proven track record, and a, and a drive to be profitable. So, so we had to, had to go against those, because and, and, Jim had a fair bit of leverage on his side. So, uh, so what we set up was, was a sort of a, a unique sort of a business. So I'll just go through it a little bit. Um, so there's obviously Kim and myself on the left, and, and Jim and Sue on the right. So we set up this uh, one in the middle here, Ash Puri, which is the 50-50 share milking business. So some of you will be, be aware of 50-50. You know, so that, that company owns all the cows, pays all the wages, owns all the machinery, etc. And we, we split that milk check 50-50. And we basically cover the, the feed costs 50-50, but all the young stock paid by the share milker. So, um, and the, the, land, the land company, which is down the bottom, that gets 50% of the milk check as well, as well as the Fonterra dividend in New Zealand. And it, pays half the feed and half the irrigation, etc. So, um, yeah, that's, that's paying for basically anything that uh, is used to run the farm. So, uh, so we, we owned 30% of it. We, we originally owned 28 um, and, and got a, bought another couple percent the other year. Jim, Jim wanted me to own 25%, so it was about the only time I thought, I thought it was actually pretty clever uh, negotiate. Jim's a pretty hard businessman, doesn't much like to give much away. So. He wanted me to be 25, I wanted to be 30, and we settled on 28, so uh, I took that as a win, because that, that was just above the middle. So, uh, um, so, so we, we were on 30% of that share milking business, which was 1,800 cows at that stage, and Jim and Sue made up the rest of it. And then the key point for this one is that through this share milking company, that actually had a stake in the land as well. So that, that's a really important thing, and I'll, I'll touch on that, why that's really important later on. And Jim and Sue have the other, other portion of it. So, you know, we sort of almost felt like we got our cake and ate it too because, you know, we had this share milking business which is higher risk but also higher return. Hence our desire to own as much of that one as we could. But also uh, a, little, a little bit more security, et cetera, in the land and, uh, and any lift in land prices. Um, yeah, we'll, t we'll touch more on, on that later. But uh, that, that's, that's, that's the crux of our... Uh, of what we've got set up, and, and I guess yeah, just is a little bit different. There's, there's not a lot of uh, equity 50/50 arrangements in New Zealand, and and very few of them that, that own part of the land as well. So, um, so so what are some of the strengths of, of that business structure? For the big one and the most important, I think, is, is fair fair return for for what everybody's got put in there, and and we'll touch more on that later. Uh, the businesses are interlinked, the, the share milking business and the land, uh, it's all, all as one. A desire to grow and, and probably more important than any, but the Graylings and Vanderpols, their, their vision and uh, their values probably aligned quite well. So fair return. So, so important when, you, when you're considering setting up a business that you don't have one party being better rewarded than the other. If you're a farm owner and you've got a, a share milker on that's, that's just extracting money, extracting money, and you're struggling to reinvest in the farm, the lifetime of that business is just, just limited because it's not going to last for him and he's going to wonder why the share milker's gone out and bought a new truck while he can't, uh, you know, put a new hose in, in his cow shed. So, so, so important to, uh, to have a fair return. So I chose 50-50 share milking uh, compared to other ones such as contract milking where you get paid a certain uh, rate, say a dollar a kilo of milk solids, or variable order share milking where you get a lower percentage, say 17, 18% and pay all the wages because I, I felt like I didn't have enough skin in the game. So those, those contracts, contract milking or variable order probably would have been better for me 
as a cash return, but I sat in Jim's seat and, and I knew he wouldn't be comfortable with that, so uh, because I didn't have any skin in the game. So, but if I could go buy, out and buy some cows, then that's showing a commitment to that business and to dairy farming, uh, you know, which is probably more important, that, that we're in this for the long haul. So that was really important to me. And getting good returns, so the 50 is a good return. There are definitely better 50-50 arrangements out there than what we've got, but uh, we think it's fair enough, and, and we've got a few other things that sort of uh, make it worthwhile for the uh, setup that we've got. And it rewards both parties. I've got the energy and the drive to do it, and uh, good to get up at my opportunity clock in the morning, Matthew. I thought that was quite good. But, and, and Jim brings a lot of nous and business, business expertise, etc., into it as well. And so we, we benefit from that. So the businesses being interlinked, so massively important for... Uh, we couldn't do this without the security of this business. We, there's no way we could go out and... At the, when we first started, we uh, had 500 cows equivalent. And there's no way we could have gone... And, turn 100 cows into 500, and, and now we, we have 1,000 as, as part of that 3,000 uh, total. So hugely important for finan financially, um, but, but more importantly, as a contract, so the 50-50 is high risk on the open market. If, if you're out there being a 50-50 share milker, you've got a, basically usually a three-year contract. Um, Matthew will know, you know, if at the end of his three-year contract, the guy says, I'm done with share milking. Matthew's left exposed, okay? So he's, he's a good operator, so he's going to try and get around that. But in New Zealand, the, the amount of 50-50 jobs are, are, are not that prevalent and are well held on to. So to get another good job is very um, difficult. So I thought owning part of the farm and getting a vote for whether we employ a share milker or not would be a pretty good way of securing my contract that I might actually vote to keep the share milker that we've got and, and if, we did, if we didn't vote to keep ourselves then we must have been pretty bad. But, uh, so, we, so you know, that's hugely important and why we could forego some of the return of our 50-50 because we're pretty sure that that contract will, will keep going and going. Um, the decisions are made on the entire basis so the worst thing you can do is put a young guy on your farm and he starts just making decisions for himself, drive production up, and, and you've seen when, when production goes up, profitability is not necessarily going to go up with it. So uh, it's important that everyone's singing from the same hymn sheet and, and running it like it's, like it's your own. So I guess that's what we try and do, and, and us owning the land. Jim really drove that side of it, that we owned a share in the land, because it gives him confidence that we're not going to favour one business over the other. Growing the business. So this is basically how we've grown, and, and I get questioned a lot on... on you know, can you buy more of the business? You only, only, you only own 30% of that business. You only own 9% of that land. You, you're just a small portion of that pie. You, know, short, you, must, you must feel like you've got no control. You know, Jim lives in the North Island. There's no way he's coming to the South Island to um, get up in the morning and milk 3,000 cows, I can assure you. So, but what we didn't want to do, and so we started at 1,800 cows on the left there, and we wanted to grow. So we had, we had two options. We could, we could either grow our share of it, so the red cows, that's Kim and I. We could have grown it, we could have left the business the same size or, or, and, and grown it. But the dynamics of this business compared to this one are hugely different. And I put myself in Jim's seat for a minute and I sit there and I think, well, I've got three farms in the North Island already, I've got one down the road and I've got this buddy one in Canterbury, and all it's doing is loading this guy's back pocket. He now owns more of it. Um, what's, what's my driver to be in it to be a minority shareholder? He just wants to buy me out. Okay, he's going to give me a million dollars this year to buy out the next 20% uh, next of that, that thing. It's not what's driving Jim. Jim's not after a cash extraction. So what's driving him is growth and excitement and enthusiasm that's brought from the young person. So making sure that we're we're growing uh, sustainably together. So, um, so we, we've chosen the latter option of, of increasing the size of the pie. So our, shares is, our share holding is still the same, but we're just of, of lots more cows. So Jim's still uh, the dominant player, as, as it were. We, we're both equal, but him and Sue are obviously the dominant player in this. But we, we've, we've doubled the size of our business, which is huge for us. You know, we think we're winning here. 
and uh, yet Jim's still the major player. And th there's no way we could have done that without, without Jim and Sue, and uh, there's also no way that uh, he could have grown his size from here to there either without us, so I, I guess that's, that's the win-win. And I guess you know, that, that brings us on to how important those people are and, and making sure you align with, you know, we talk a lot about bringing young people in, etc., and, and getting a new guy onto your farm. But there's no rush to do it. You, you've got to make sure you align, and people is probably the most important thing because if you've got the right people and, and they're both talented and seeing them, the rest of it will basically look after itself. But if, you, if you've got a good operator and uh, you've got a good farm, you get two people that are completely opposite because it's more than likely to fall over. So, so that, that's massive for us. And the next thing I get challenged on is, gee, that's, that's good for you guys. You're so lucky to have Jim and Sue. And we are lucky, there's, there's no doubt about it. But everybody's basically dealt the same amount of luck. And it's what you do with it. So we were very, very lucky to find Jim and Sue with the opportunity presented us. But we were in the in the right mind, we'd, we'd done the homework that we were ready to take that opportunity. So I guess the challenge is to you guys, to young guys, is to go find those people. They do exist. And go hunt them down, find them, and just start doing what they do. What they do. And you know, you'll find that there's no point getting stuck on the guy that's going backwards. If you're in an opportunity that you think's not getting anywhere, and you think, well, I think he's talking about being, wanting an equity partner. He's been talking about it for two years. Cut your ties and move on. You know, it, it might seem real Generation Y, but this is why I guess why we're here, isn't it, Patty? <laughs> that, uh, but you know, life's too short to stick around for five years and find it was an empty promise on something that's not there. So make sure you find the guys that you get along with and uh, you, know, you can create something from nothing. You don't need the farm necessarily straight away. You need the, you need the people and you can develop the business and farming after that. So I guess, just to sum up a few of the attributes that I think, you know, when you're looking at, at building a, a dairy business and, and a sustainable and profitable one at that, um, you know, some of the, the top things is win-win, making sure you, you're viewing it, you know, it's got to be driven from the younger guy because, um, you know, he's the one out there doing it all. He's got to be the, in the driving seat and driving it all. But he has to view it through the eyes of the farm owner because the farm owner doesn't want to be... Uh, disincentivized to be part of it. He doesn't, doesn't want to be, uh, he wants to make money as well. That's what he's there for, and, and he also wants to enjoy it. You've got to have top performance to be able to warrant doing it. Uh, and, and more importantly, the nice, you, you've got to have com compatible people and uh, make sure that you, your values, etc., cetera, align. Um, and, and you've got to love doing cows. You, you, know, you, you can't do this without, without being in there, in amongst cows all the time, and have a desire and passion for dairy farming. And, and I guess, all of you guys have that already, and that's, that's why you're here, I guess. So, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that sums us up, and um, that's a little bit of our journey, and, and more than happy to take uh, questions, if yeah. it allows, on any points of clarification or, or challenges uh, of what we've done or anything that we've presented or anything you want to do. So, so over to you, Patty. Yeah, thanks, Wood.